Mr. Chair, I think we're all set to go. They uh, say we, uh, we're on. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. It's nine o'clock, May 11th, 2021. Welcome to the regular meeting of the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors. Uh, clerk, please call the roll. We can't hear you, Stephanie. Good morning and welcome to the Santa Cruz County Board of Supervisors May 11th meeting pursuant to the provisions of Governor Newsom's Executive Order N-29-20. This meeting is being held virtually. The county welcomes the public to participate in today's meeting using the Zoom link provided on our website at santacruzcountyca.iqm2.com. Click on today's date and then the agenda. You will find the Zoom link at the top of the page or you can type it in as it appears on your screen. If you wish to participate by phone, you may do so by dialing 1-669-900-6833. The meeting ID is 8407832-7816. If you have any questions or need further assistance, please contact the clerk of the board's office at 831-454-2323. And for the roll, Supervisor Koenig? Here. Friend? Here. Coonerty? Here. Caput? Here. McPherson? Here. Thank you, Chair. You have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, we will go to item number two, a moment of silence, uh, Pledge of Allegiance. But before we go to the pledge, uh, I think uh, Supervisor Coonerty wanted to acknowledge someone in our community who just passed away. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to take a moment and honor uh, the passing of Roberta Smith. She was a fixture on the North Coast, active in a ton of different volunteer organizations. She was also an accomplished geologist and just a wonderful person to be around. She passed away this week, and I ask you to keep the uh, her family and friends uh, in your thoughts uh, during the moment of silence. Thank you. Uh, I also have uh, acknowledgement of somebody who just passed away, really an icon and a tremendous person from the University of California, Santa Cruz, Bill Doyle. He was in the marine sciences and he really got together to start the Friends of Long Marine Lab. I mean, he was a, a tremendous uh, marine scientist himself. But uh, he was the one that really established Friends of Long Marine Lab, which I was a member from its inception. And I thought it did more to bring the community of Santa Cruz and UCSC together to have a better understanding of the operations of the university. Uh, we had the president of the University of California, David Gardner, here at one time. Bill Doyle was a phenomenal person. Uh, he died at the age of 91, and uh, he was really a special person for this community, for the University of California, Santa Cruz. Anyone else who might have a comment? Okay, uh, we will go to item number three, or excuse me, we'll go to the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, any um, consideration of late additions to the agenda, uh, additions or deletions to the consent or regular agendas? Uh, yes, uh, Chair McPherson and members of the board. On the consent agenda, on item number 30, staff requests that this item be deleted. And on item number 33, uh, staff requests this item be deleted. And that um, that ends our uh, corrections and additions to the today's agenda. Okay. Any announcement by board members of items removed from the consent to regular the regular agenda? Seeing none, we'll go to item number five, uh, public comment. This is an opportunity for any person to address us, uh, the board, uh, once during a public comment, not exceeding two minutes. The comments must be directed to items on today's consent or closed session agendas, yet to be heard items on the regular agenda or on a topic not on today's agenda, but within jurisdiction of the Board of Supervisors. We'll take public, public comments now for up to 30 minutes. If necessary, additional time for public comment will be allowed after the last item on today's regular agenda. Do we have anyone who would like to address this under public comments? Yes, Chair, I have several members of the public that would like to address the board. Speakers, as a reminder, you have two minutes. You'll see a notice on your screen to unmute your microphone. 
And once you begin speaking, the timer will begin. You'll have two minutes, which will end automatically. Carol, your microphone is available. Good morning. How many Americans have died after taking the COVID vaccine? So um, just to, before I answer that, just to compare, um, a lot of people get the flu vaccine regularly. Um, so for example, in 2017 through 2019, about 160 million Americans received the flu vaccine. In 2017, 85 people passed away after receiving the flu vaccine. In 2018, 119 people passed away after receiving the flu vaccine. And in 2019, 203 people died after receiving the flu vaccine. So how do those numbers compare to the death rate after receiving the COVID vaccine? So from the same governmental source where those numbers came from, um, between late December and April, 3,362 people died after receiving the COVID vaccine. And also let's just compare that quickly to the attacks um, on September 11th. About 3,000 people died at that time and our country was mourning those deaths. And I don't see um, this information getting out and I don't see people mourning the deaths of, of these people, um, which, is, which is unusual. Um, and, and then further, why is the county saying that this COVID vaccine is safe when more than 3,000 people have died after taking this vaccine? It just begs the question of what's really going on and why is the county incentivizing people to get the vaccine? Why wouldn't the county encourage people to be fully informed of the benefits and risk of the vaccine in a private consultation with a doctor of their choice? And why hasn't the county informed people that there are other treatments available like ivermectin and hydroxychloroquine, which have a much lower risk? For anyone listening that would like to know more about these um, le less risky treatments, please go to americasfrontlinedoctors.com americasfrontlinedoctors.com, americasfrontlinedoctors.com. Jean Brockelback and Michael Lewis, please identify yourself and your microphone is unmuted. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. I'm Jean Brocklebank, speaking on behalf of the Freedom from Fireworks campaign. We wrote to all of you last Friday and are here to remind you of the nine specific 2016 directives regarding fireworks passed unanimously by this board and to ask that they be implemented once more well before this 4th of July when it is quite possible thousands of people will be celebrating their freedom from COVID regulations by causing destructive mayhem throughout the county. This year, fire hazard is on everyone's mind. To that, we add health impacts of breathing polluted air filled with chemical toxins from fireworks, toxins that contaminate all waterways leading to the Monterey Bay National Marine Sanctuary. Add to fire hazard and environmental health the intense barrage of the harmful noise of fireworks, which affects people, especially veterans with PTSD, as well as pets and wildlife. Therefore, we ask that the 2016 directives be reissued for 2021, introduced in a consent agenda item on your May 25th meeting, and include these additional directives for this year. Add Airbnb properties to vacation rentals, a press release once a week starting in June, request Caltrans to use its digital signs on Highway 17 for one full week ahead of July 4th. And for next year, these additional two directives. Reconvene the apparently now defunct annual fireworks task force meetings of all jurisdictions of law enforcement officials, fire chiefs, and state parks that used to occur each February. And two, draft a social host ordinance regarding fireworks possession and use that would be included in the permit for vacation rentals rather than relying on letters to property owners. Thank you so much for considering our requests. Garrett, your microphone is unmuted. Brett Garrett. Good morning. This is Brett Garrett from Santa Cruz. Um, I deeply appreciate the county's recent resolution in support of um, regarding net energy metering and so promoting clean energy. I hope you'll take this a step further and pass a resolution to oppose AB 1139, which is anti-solar 
legislation at its worst. Um, AB 1139 claims to be an equity bill, but it will hurt everyone by increasing transmission costs and by reducing distributed resources, resulting in less resilience and more environmental damage. AB 1139 obliterates net energy metering by changing the basic solar production from a retail rate to a wholesale rate of compensation. Furthermore, it imposes a monthly grid access charge that will act it actually results in some solar customers paying higher utility costs than if they had never installed solar in the first place. Fixing the duck curve requires more batteries, not fewer solar panels. Net energy metering reform should be oriented toward encouraging more energy storage, not discouraging solar panels. So please oppose 1139, AB 1139. And closer to home, I'm very concerned about uh, Central Coast Community Energy's proposal um, to make some um, changes to their rate plans that, um, that I don't agree with. It's a sort of reverse Robin Hood take more money from the smallest residential customers who don't use much energy and provide excess saving to non-solar commercial and agricultural customers. Um, please oppose the fixed monthly charge of four and a half dollars, which disproportionately impacts low income customers. And please oppose all provisions that harm solar customers. Um, yeah, so please again, oppose AB 1139 and some of the, I'm concerned about the three CE changes. Thank you very much. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Good morning, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Good morning to, um, to the supervisors and to the public who's participating. I request respectfully that the board install some method by which people like me who can only participate in these meetings via telephone so that we can fully see the budget presentations next month. Um, there are many good discussions that come up during those budget hearings that revolve around screen and slide presentations, but those of us at home with only a telephone to participate will not be able to see them. I would very much appreciate, as would many other elderly members in the community, if there is a way for us to come to the county building or ask the public libraries to set up a dedicated screen um, whereby we can see those and hear those presentations and participate. I would also like to um, ask, uh, and I want to thank you on item consent agenda item 16 uh, regarding changing the way that your salaries are adjusted. Many thanks to Supervisor Caput and Supervisor Friend for making this change. I think it's much more equitable. And I know Supervisor Caput and I have agreed for many years that the board should not be voting on their own pay increases. So tying it to the, the rates of the uh, judges, Superior Court judges, is fair, and I want to thank you for that change. Item number 50, I'm happy to see that some more of the rural roads in the District 2 area will be repaired from the 2017 storms. This will not only uh, improve infrastructure, but will improve the safety of any fire evacuations that might need to happen. Call in user one, your microphone is unmuted. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and we should have three minutes like we've had over the years for comments. I have a brand new book in front of me titled The Truth About COVID-19, Exposing the Great Reset, Lockdowns, Vaccine Passports, and the New Normal, Why We Must Unite in a Global Movement for Health and Freedom by Dr. Joseph Mercola and Ronnie Cummins with a foreword by Robert F. Kennedy Jr. It's put out by Chelsea Press. Just a little bit from Robert F. Kennedy Jr.'s foreword. 
instead of citing scientific studies to justify mandates for masks, lockdowns, and vaccines, our medical rulers cite who CDC, FDA, and NIH, captive agencies that are groveling sock puppets to the industries they regulate. Multiple federal and international investigations have documented the financial entanglements with pharmaceutical companies that have made these regulators cesspools of corruption. Then he goes on to talk about uh, medical physicians ruling. The medical profession has not proven itself an energetic defender of democratic institutions or civil rights. Virtually every doctor in Germany took lead roles in the Third Reich's project to eliminate mental defectives, homosexuals, handicapped citizens, and Jews. So many hundreds of German participation. Barry Scott, your microphone is unmuted. Uh, thank you. This is Barry Scott. I live in Aptos, and I want to thank the uh, all of our supervisors for doing a, a tremendous amount of good good work in the community. I wanted to speak quickly to the uh, passenger rail, electric passenger rail business plan that failed uh, uh, by by tied uh, a bit of six six vote and. Um, encourage uh, our commissioners to look at page 13 of the business plan, which includes a streetcar option. My profile image shows the TIGM streetcar that received uh, by unanimous vote of the RTC a license to uh, provide a demonstration on our tracks between Bird Boardwalk and Capitola that would have happened in May, but COVID uh, prevented this from happening. It's, it's planned for later this year. And uh, we think a streetcar option, which is permitted within the business plan, could, could come in at something like half the cost. A second thing I, I re re regret to, to need to bring up has to do with our representation on the RTC. And I was reading a letter sent to you from Alex Yazbek uh, regarding uh, a request that Manu Koenig step down from the RTC or be removed from the RTC uh, because of his likely conflict of interest having come from Greenway. Uh, an organization dedicated to removing the tracks, regardless of what the, the, the community has expressed they want. And uh, the fact that he seems to own the property within a thousand feet uh, over by Simpkins of the corridor would suggest that he has a similar conflict or potential conflict that uh, Supervisor Friend had. So I'd like, uh, I'd like to uh, uh, join Alex in, uh, in requesting that this conflict be investigated and perhaps. Uh, man who recused himself from decisions on the rail corridor. That's all I have. Thank you. Dayton Reardon, your microphone is available. Hello, this is Dayton Reardon. Um, we have been an owner of a condo at 396 Ocean View in the Freedom Sewer District since 70. There's a bond proposal in the amount of 2.3 million to redo the sewer district. It's very old. Back in about late 1970s, early 1980s, our PDMA association donated a large parcel of land for the leach field for this sewer district uh, to the county. And a number of new houses uh, in a development were added to our sewer system since that time and also a number of condo units at the end of Ocean View. And it just seems to me that I would ask the board to look into this issue. We've been trying to get information from the county about that transaction and how it might impact this bond issue. And we only have one option, well, two options for our sewer district. One is they are, they're sending trucks in to pump the tanks all the time which is an expensive and endeavor for the county and the sewer district. The option on the table is to um, do some upgrades uh, to the tank and the leach field, 2.3 million. 
There's another option that we wanted the county to explore, which was to connect to a sewer district two miles away, which would solve the problem permanently. And I'm just wondering if the board could look into that for us or instruct the county to look into that for us. And I'll thank you very much for your time and appreciate your um, time and efforts on behalf of the county. Thank you. Jonathan Gettleman, your microphone is available. Okay, I just unmuted myself. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, good morning. My name is Jonathan Gettleman, and I'm an attorney with the Law Office of Caballero and Gettleman. We represent a gentleman by the name of David Klein in a federal litigation that's on the closed session agenda. Mr. Klein was badly injured by Santa Cruz County Sheriff's officers in Felton Covered Bridge Park in 2017 after being unnecessarily tased and landing directly on his head on the concrete from standing. This happened during a welfare check of his senior mother who had fallen earlier that day on her way to the park bathroom. We are before you today because David is developmentally disabled and homeless. The drawing out of this litigation is causing irreparable damage to our client. The evidence we are asking you to review today in closed session will demonstrate the substantial value of the unconstitutional violence inflicted upon David. The three most important categories of evidence for your review today are one, the video. It's labeled Ethan Rumrell and it's ending in zero zero. So that's the particular video we would like you to review. You'll see the assault occurs within several minutes of the start of the video. It's important to note prior to the assault, David Klein was calmly talking to officers for 40 minutes. The video starts with police threatening to take his independent mother to the hospital against her will. Second, all three percipient witness statements. They uniformly denounce the police aggressiveness and unnecessarily, unnecessary violence from a reasonable onlooker's perspective. And third, the report and CV of policing expert Scott Defoe. He is nationally renowned and very qualified he precisely explains the constitutional violations, particularly the excessive force, with bullet point supporting facts. Thank you very much for your review. Eve Robertson, your microphone is unmuted. Eve, you'll need to press to unmute your microphone. There you go. I'm showing that you're unmuted. We'll move to caller 1999. Good morning. My name is James Ewing Whitman. Uh, I'm wow. I'm pretty down on the list considering I got on at 901. First, I'd like to thank Carol for your observations. She was the first speaker. Um, in regards to consent agenda item number 17, which reads adopt ordinance adding chapter 12.32 to the SC code relating to listed limited density owner built rural dwelling dwellings. Um, Approving concept on April 27th. This seems to have to do with the last chance area. Um, this kind of relates to freedom from fireworks. I spoke about this on September 15th of 2020. Um, back to freedom from fireworks, constructive mayhem could, should be a subtitle. How about the RAND Corporation that has controlled con Congress in their constructive mayhem since 1948, creating such a following of fiduciary trust malfeasances where the eugenics agendas of Agenda 21-2030 were adopted in 1997 through the SEEDS agenda by this county. Um, I'm gonna quote Augustine of Hippo. Right is 
right is right even if no one is doing it. Wrong is wrong even if everyone is doing it. And this is from Best Quotes Ever. We've been conditioned to think that only politicians can solve our problems, but at some point, maybe we will wake up and recognize that, that it's that it was the politicians who created the problems. Now, this is a quote by Ben Carson, but uh, Augustine de Hippo, who lived before Christ, said many similar things. Um, and I guess I'll just finish. A mistake does not become an error unless you refuse to correct it. Thank you. We're going to attempt Eve Robertson again. Your microphone is available. And as a reminder to caller, speakers are allowed to speak once per item or to the consent ag agenda. Thank you. Okay, Eve, I'm showing you, you are unmuted. Your microphone is showing as available. Okay, Chair, I believe this person is having difficulty with the application. They are showing as unmuted and able to speak, and we're still not hearing them. We'll go ahead and end public comment with that person. There are no other speakers, Chair. Okay, we'll close the public comment period. We'll go to item number six, action on the consent uh, agenda, items 13 through 50. There's been a few deleted uh, already, but uh, Supervisor... Uh, uh, Koenig, do you have any uh, comments on any consent agenda item? Yes, thank you, Chair. On item 22, the Santa Cruz County Tourism Marketing District Plan, I just want to thank Maggie Ivey and the team from Visit Santa Cruz County. It's fantastic to see such a high opt-in rate from local hotels, ranging from the Chaminade to Ocean Echo Inn. And this marketing is really going to help with the shoulder season of spring and fall uh, for our local hotels. On item 24, the Grow Santa Cruz County Revolving Loan Fund. It's very encouraging to see that we'll soon have, have as much as $2.7 million uh, to make available to small unincorporated county businesses. Um, and of course, we should be doing everything we can to support small businesses in these difficult times. On item um, 31, I wanna thank Richard Rubin for applying to be the consumer representative on the Emergency Medical Care Commission. He brings 31 years of experience in the Aptos and Selva Fire District, 13 years of experience in incident management with the US Forest Service, and an additional seven years of experience uh, as a primary instructor and emergency medical technician. So I think he'll serve us well. On item number 39, the three-year tobacco law enforcement prevention grant uh, to fund the Sheriff's Tobacco uh, Office, of, uh, Office of Tobacco Prevention. Um, you know, the, the Sheriff's Office will be conducting compliance checks and issuing penalties for shops that sell tobacco products to minors. Um, and, you know, I think it's great. We're aiming for 90% compliance. Uh, my question would just be what level of compliance we're at now so that we establish a baseline and can measure the effectiveness of the program. And then finally, on item 45, the collaborative renegotiation of the contract with Housing Matters to purchase 10 more pallet shelters with heat funds. Uh, I think this is a great amendment to the contract, and I commend the Human Services Director uh, for working out this deal and increasing our supply of emergency shelters, um, particularly the pallet shelters from uh, 30 up to 40. So, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Supervisor Friend, do you have any comments on the consent agenda? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, and just a couple brief comments. Just appreciate the work of county staff on the very initial county proposed budget information. Um, definitely some good news on some of the state and federal components. I recognize we're still pretty deep in the hole, and so we'll be looking forward to um, not just what the board had directed for additional information uh, and the additional million dollars at the last meeting, but also just to make sure that what we're doing does adequately rebuild those reserves and contingencies given the emergencies we saw this year, I, I think that it is prudent that we do that as soon as possible in our rebuilds, not just maybe even a five-year plan, but something a little sooner. I'd like to echo Supervisor Koenig's comments regarding the TMD on item 22 and the, and the work of Visit Santa Cruz County. Um, clicking through at all the jurisdictions, it was uh, remarkable to see how much support there was for this um, and how far we've come from the beginning of the implementation as well as the expansion of the vacation rentals. I think it's a very important program and a very important component. Uh, for both employment and visitor serving accommodations in our community. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's all. Thank you. Supervisor Coonerty. 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just want to briefly, uh, as Supervisor Koenig pointed out, item number 24, $6 million uh, for small businesses in a revolving loan fund for businesses that don't have access to other uh, capital through other means. Um, it's, a, it's a great investment in small businesses that have been hit really hard over the past um, year and a half, and I think uh, will be a will pay benefits both in jobs and revenues uh, for years to come. Thank you, uh, Supervisor Kaplan. Thank you, Chairman McPherson. I uh, just want to, uh, on item number forty-four, uh, thank the Salvation Army for the wonderful work they're doing down here in Watsonville with the homeless shelter and uh, all the work they're doing. Uh, it, they've, it's been a very difficult year, of course, for them and everybody else, but uh, they're, they're just uh, doing a great job down here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I have a couple of comments I'd like to make too. Uh, item number 21, um, on the fiscal year 21-22 budget, I'd like to make some comments about, uh, to thank and congratulate the county staff uh, who contributed to the budget this year. Most especially our retiring uh, budget manager, Christina Mowry, and we're going to try to keep her here if we can. I don't think it's going to happen. But once again, we have a budget that is very accessible and transparent. Um, this is, we all know this has been a particularly difficult uh, budget uh, to prepare due to the ongoing uncertainty related to COVID and the fire recovery. But we have done an excellent job of preparing the best we can with uh, what we know right now. I'm especially grateful that we will receive the $53 million as part of the Mes uh, American Rescue Plan. And I look forward to working with the board to ensure we restore our losses the best we can, uh, supporting our workforce and our community as it recovers. I also especially appreciate the cautious, cautious approach to the recovery that we've, we've uh, set aside funds for potential expenditures that we still don't know. FEMA may not reverse it, uh, reimburse us for uh, the total amount that we, we wish, but um, as well as uh, drafting the plan to bring back uh, the reserves to 10% level. Uh, extremely important. And I look forward to our budget hearings in June and learning more about how our departments have creatively solved problems and served our community despite all the many challenges of the past year. And I especially want to point out to our CAO, Carlos Palacios, who's tried to manage this. He has managed this to the best of his abilities, and those abilities are much appreciated because um, we are on the right track. We're being cautious, and we're going to be uh, we're going to be looking ahead, though, to see what we can do to serve the people of Santa Cruz County to the best of our abilities. Um, also, I uh, on the uh, item number twenty four, the revolving loan fund. This is a tremendous opportunity. There's six million dollars potential um, total for the four cities and the counties. Uh, the county uh, due to get almost half of that, about two point seven million. Uh, I would like to give some additional direction, if I could, uh, to come back to the board on June 8th uh, with uh, a report on how this, um, how we'll, uh, how we will determine uh, the eligibility, uh, where the maximum and minimum amounts could be, what are the reporting requirements. A couple of questions that I will uh, send on to the uh, CAO's office. That would be uh, very much appreciated if we could get some uh, more information on that. I. Uh, I do appreciate um, Jennifer Mount be, uh, be coming to our Library Advisory Commission. Uh, we've got a lot of good things going on in our libraries throughout the county. Uh, and Carol Bird to the Housing Authority, uh, that's item number 38. Uh, that's very much appreciated. And like Mr. Uh, or Supervisor uh, Caput, I really do want to say thank you, Number item number uh, 44, to the Salvation Army. Um, it, they've really worked for several years to provide sheltering services to our community. And without them, we, we simply uh, would not have been able to maintain our shelter capacity uh, before, during, and after COVID. So um, I really appreciate the Salvation Army and working with us uh, has helped immensely for us to help shelter people in Santa Cruz County. Uh, with that, I would entertain a motion um, with uh, additional direction that I mentioned. Is there anybody the consent agenda with additional direction? Second. second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded. Please call the roll. Thank you for clarification. Was the mover Supervisor Koenig and Seconder Coonerty? Thank you. Correct. Supervisor Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. Coonerty? 
Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Okay, we will now move to our regular agenda, item number seven, to consider the selection of Jan Janice Cirilla as the artist for the Animal Shelter Renovation Phase One Public Art Project, adopt resolution accepting unanticipated revenue in the amount of $16,700, approve the independent contractor agreement for it, an amount not to exceed $15,000, and authorize the parks director to sign agreement and take related issues as outlined in the memorandum of the director of parks, open space and cultural services. We have a contract with Janice Cirillo, uh, a resolution, AUD 60 insurance for Janice Cirillo, public art proposal, exhibit one, and administrative uh, ADM 2921. I think that uh, is uh, our Parks Superintendent, uh, Jeff Gaffney. There, there's Janice there too. It's nice to see you and thank Hi. you very much. Look at those animals behind you. <laughs> hey, Jeff, uh, Mr. Gaffney, our Parks Director. Thank you, Chair McPherson and uh, fellow board members. Uh, you previously had approved uh, the concept of placing public art out at the Animal Services campus um, as part of the renovations out there. And so we had, uh, in December 2020, we had our Arts Commission uh, formed an art selection panel, and they had an open competition that was advertised for the creation of the, the public art. Um, and so now, as a result of that, it's, it's actually, um, I'm going to have one of our Arts Commissioners, Margaret Niven, it's my pleasure to introduce Margaret, um, as part of the selection panel, and she will go over the selection process for the project with you and um, who, they, who they selected and why. Margaret? Yes, good morning, thank you. The Arts Commission is pleased to recommend a proposal for the Animal Shelter Public Art Project for your approval today. The art selection panel comprised of community members, professional artists, county arts commissioners, and a representative of the Animal Shelter met on February 26 to review proposals and interview two artists. The artists were asked to bring detailed drawings or a maquette to further define their project proposals. After much deliberation, the panel chose Janice Cirilla to continue in the selection process. At the March 1st meeting of the Arts Commission, the commission reviewed the panel's decision and voted to recommend that your board approve the selection of Ms. Cirilla as the public artist for the animal shelter. Her beautiful artwork will be installed throughout the cat and rabbit housing areas and the new community cat room. I'd now like to introduce the artist Janice Cirilla will give a brief presentation of her fabulous proposal and answer any questions you might have. Janice. Hi, nice to meet everybody. I'm very honored to be chosen for the project. Um, obviously, <laughs> I'm a big animal lover and I um, like to rescue and foster animals. So it's like definitely up my alley and um, I'm going to be creating some actual just paintings that's going to be on the wall and as well as murals that will be applied directly to the walls in the rabbit and in the cat space. And um, I'm also considering creating like a interactive art piece that could be something like for the unveiling of the art that kids and animals can put their stamp on, so to speak. So that'd be something that'd be kind of fun to kind of you know, bring the community together and just, you know, everybody come in and enjoy the art and check out the animals and, you know, just. <laughs> I, I, I think uh, we have, um, I think we have the ability to share some of what the project will look like right now. Is that, is that correct? There we go. So just so we're, everybody's aware, this is what the proposal will be looking like. And here are some of the, um, proposed sketches for um, placement. Yeah, so basically like the large cat, or you can see like in the top two views, like a figure like a giant mural on the wall space and um, like in the rabbit room and in the cat room and then wherever there's in between doors and windows or if there's small space, that's where I could just place some canvas art, like headshots of animals. And the two bottom images are just, just some ideas representing as well just you know my, my style is basically giant headshots so you know keep trying to be keep true to my my art style looks great thank you supervisor mcpherson 
Well, thank you. Yeah, and thank you, um, Janice, if I may use your first name. Uh, you know, uh, animals give us all, we all have pets or, or relatives who are pets or friends, and uh, it's just a calming, soothing of impact on everyone. And your your paintings, your, your artwork, just uh, add to that, or, or, or really, uh, it's just really a, a great addition for us. And we really appreciate what you have done to help people uh, through these trying times. I think it's gonna be a, a real calming effect for everyone. Yeah, thank you so much, appreciate it. Any other comments from board members? Supervisor Koenig, did you? Sure, yeah, thank you, Chair. I just uh, wanna congratulate you, Janice, on uh, winning the competition and it's fantastic. You know, that uh, you are an animal lover yourself and will be able to bring that into your artwork. Um, I know the, the animal shelter will look much better uh, with your contributions and I'm really excited to see them. Um, and I would definitely encourage you to, to create an interactive portion as well. I think that would be really yeah. exciting to see. Yeah. Um, so, so thank you and good luck with the project. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Any other supervisor wishes to make a comment? I think we all agree this is going to be a great addition. Um, I'll entertain a motion. I think we need to consider to accept this, please. Uh, motion. Excuse me, Supervisor. We do have two speakers to this item. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me, Stephanie. Uh, okay. Uh, go ahead. Thank you. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Good morning. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Good morning. And uh, thank you to the artist who has submitted these beautiful pieces of work and congratulations on winning the contract. I'm happy to hear that she is planning to incorporate an interactive component for the public. To that end, I would like to ask that the Arts Commission um, encourage students to display their work from schoolwork, um, just to keep it a fresh display of art and something that would directly involve the children, the local community, to have uh, revolving artwork displays that the kids submit and display. I think that would really keep this artwork in the public place idea alive and involve the children and the community directly. So I hope that uh, your board will look into that. The Arts Commission will look into that. And I think that would be a real asset in addition to these lovely works that Ms. Sevilla is going to do. Thank you very much. Call in user one, your microphone is available. Congratulations, Janice. I definitely like to see your work. I'm uh, just on a phone here and I have a couple of questions. Um, what is the address of where your work will be displayed? I mean, it doesn't say on my regular agenda. And the second question is, it says in parentheses after your name, E sign. What What is an e-sign? I'm a low-tech uh, person. I'm speaking to you on a landline. So I'd appreciate the response to those uh, two questions. And again, thank you so much for your art. Um, the artwork is going to be at the Santa Cruz County Animal Shelter location. Um, it's going to be, I think they're adding an addition that will be the cat room. And I believe that they... This I'm not 100% sure, but I believe they're going to be utilizing another space in the building to become the rabbit room. And I don't know about the e sign thing. I think that's, that's I don't know. Seventh Avenue, right? I'm sorry. Seventh and Seventh and Rodriguez. Yes. And that that Seventh and Rodriguez in Libo. Yes. yes. Okay. Um, Thank you, Chair. There are no other speakers to this item. Okay, um, I'll entertain a motion to accept. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Coonerty, a friend, please call the roll. I think it was uh, Supervisor Coney. Okay. Yeah. Thank oh. you, Supervisor. Okay, so I have the mover is Supervisor Koenig, seconder Supervisor Friend, oh. and for the Thank vote, you. Supervisor Friend, Koenig? Aye. Friend? Aye. 
Cooterty? Aye. Caput? Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Gaffney. No, I said thank you. Have a good okay. break. Great. Thank you for doing that. That's great. Okay, we will move to item number eight, consider approval and concept of ordinance amending chapter 5.47 of the Santa Cruz County Code to delay implementation of the mandatory charge for disposable cups to January 1st, 2022. Schedule ordinance for final adoption on May 18th, 2021, and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the Deputy CEO Director of Public Works. We have an ordinance amending Santa Cruz County Code 5.47070. B, amendments to SCCC 5.47.070, strike out an underlying copy. Uh, Casey Kloss is going to present this to us. Good morning, Supervisor McPherson and rest of the board. Um, I'm Casey Klossel with Par Public Works Department. Um, on December 10th, 2019, the board adopted an ordinance adding chapter 5.47 to the county code to address litter and pollution in single use disposable cups. On August 4th, 2020, due to concerns about the COVID-19 virus, the board amended the ordinance to delay implementation until January 1st, 2021. The COVID-19 virus continues to be a major health concern in Santa Cruz County. Many businesses have closed and others have made substantial changes to their operating procedures to keep workers and the public healthy and safe. While there is hope for an end to the pandemic in the near future, an additional delay to implementation of the ordinance until January 1, 2022 is recommended. Um, so the recommended actions are a proven concept ordinance amending chapter 5.47 of the Santa Cruz County Code to delay implementation of the mandatory charge for disposable cups to January 1, 2022 and schedule the ordinance for final adoption on May 18th, 2021. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any comments from the board? The board. This, Mr. Chair, I have a brief comment. Uh, I'm in support of this. I appreciate the work of Mr. Kloss and the entire Public Works team. Uh, and I understand that other jurisdictions are, are doing similar actions to this as well. Um, I'm still interested, um, since especially because we have kind of a long time before implementation, I'm interested in that continued discussion about the allocation of these funds via a ballot measure specifically to environmental programs. Um, I think that there's definitely a, um, you know, people, again, when they pay these fees, they think that it's going into something other than just back uh, to the business. I think there's an ability here to have a, a shared money between the business to recoup costs, maybe even make a little bit on it, but also fund uh, much needed environmental programs, uh, especially with some of the additional waste that we've seen from single use products. It's really exploded <laughs> uh, during this pandemic. So I'd still like to see as we move into uh, an election year next year that the implementation come part and parcel with that. Um, but I do appreciate this and support the delayed implementation until January of next year. Thank you. Okay, taken. Uh, any other comments from board members? Chair? Yes, uh, Supervisor Coney. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, it's, uh, of course, we wanna do everything we can to reduce plastic pollution. And, and we're really, it's incumbent upon us here in the Monterey Bay area uh, to be leaders for the rest of the state and the country. Uh, and we have been on the, in the past, and uh, certainly we will be ultimately when we implement this uh, fee on disposable cups. That said, we really also need to work with businesses. I mean, after all, um, this, uh, the, the only enforcement mechanism we have on this um, will be uh, reports from people shopping in these businesses. Um, and so we want to create a situation where businesses feel supported and uh, willingly comply. And I think this is a very difficult time uh, this year to try to implement new regulations. Um, and it would probably ultimately lead to less compliance uh, and a bit of a rockier start for this program. So I, I do think it's in our best interest to delay the implementation. Uh, and I agree with Supervisor Friend that uh, there, there could be some opportunities to ultimately uh, use the, the fee collected uh, to support waste reduction um, practices throughout the county and look forward to working on that in the future. Very well. 
any other comments from the board? Seeing none, do we have any comments from the public? Yes, I have two callers. Call in user one, your microphone is available. Hi, this is Marilyn Garrett, and I am looking at the zero waste news that is published by the county for winter 2021. And there is a ghastly picture here with the title Plastic Plague COVID-19 unleashed a tidal wave of plastic waste. So the county has actually mandated with all of these uh, lockdown supposedly measures to protect our health, more plastic, which is uh, really destroying the planet along with other things. And I remember hearing uh, news in July of 2019, that $180 billion had, was put into new plastic production. And there are microplastics everywhere circulating in the air. So this is... Caller 2915, your microphone. You know, I, I don't know if we only gave her one minute. Uh it started at 1 minute 48 seconds. Oh, excuse me. It was running in the back. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Excuse me. Go ahead. Caller 2915. Caller 2915. Hello. This is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Um, I, I support recycling completely. And I really think that pushing this out to January 1st, 2022 is too long. Since it is being delayed because of COVID, why not tie it to the county's movement in um, safety, public safety, and the governor's edict regarding COVID restrictions, which I understand could be lifted sooner than January 1st, 2022, in large measure. So I would like to see the board instead tie it to that rather than keep pushing it farther out, as you've all seen and heard there is a, a vast increase in the landfill and in the trash cans in front of the county building of disposable uh, food containers. And this could help reduce that if we do this now. At the very least, I think that um, beverages should only receive plastic lids upon request. I received a plastic lid on my drink that I didn't need, I didn't want, but they plopped it on there, and that just adds additional plastic to the landfill. And I agree with Supervisor Friend that we really need to make it clear to the public how this money will be spent, how it will be used, and exactly what it is that the program will support. Thank you very much. Thank you. There are no other speakers for this item. Okay, well, return that, uh, return this to the board. Uh, action. Mr. Chair, I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Uh, friend and Caput, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we will move to item number nine to consider adoption of a resolution authorizing the issuance of one or more series of pension obligation bonds to refinance the outstanding obligations of the county to the California Public Employees Retirement System or CalPERS with respect to the county's safety plan and safety sheriff plan authorizing a judicial validation action and approving the and directing related matters as outlined in the memorandum of uh, county administrative officer we have items a through k that i do not think i need to uh mention each one of them but there are uh, uh there's the issuance of the uh, pobs um the the payment the budgetary Im impact and so forth uh that have, have been in the agenda um, I will uh, 
I don't know if it's Christina Mowry, our budget director, or is it Marcus Pinmentel who will be presenting? I think it's Marcus Pinmentel. Actually, it's both of us. Good morning, okay. uh, All right. Chair McPherson. Thank this you. is uh, Christina Mowry, your county budget manager. Um, and I am joined today by Marcus Pimental, who has joined our office this year and leading several projects as we continue to manage through the emergency. Um, Marcus has over 20 years uh, experience in finance and administration and a previous finance director for the city of Santa Cruz and the city of Watsonville. And he is currently working uh, with our, uh, he's taking the lead on this project and he's currently working with our financial advisor, Suzanne Harrell from Harrell and Associates. Uh, so they will be providing details on, on this particular project and as we consider pension obligation bonds. And I also want to mention that Jones uh, Hall is our bond counsel on this project and Juan Galvin is available in case there are any questions as well. So next slide. Um, we want to just sort of give you an overview. This, this presentation is going to sort of summarize the detailed information provided in the board report. There is quite a few attachments. Um, and we'll summarize the debt management action, highlight what are pension obligation bonds, their risks and options and perspectives that we considered. Um, this agenda item allows us to continue the process towards returning to your board in August to finalize the amount. And at that time, consider uh, whether to authorize staff to issue the actual pension obligation bonds and approve the associated uh, policy on retirement obligations. So next slide. So as your board knows, uh, the board approved the County of Santa Cruz debt management policy in 2017 uh, that created the debt advisory committee. Uh, their, ro their roles include regular reviews uh, of our county debt and make recommendations on debt financing to ensure that proper due diligence is completed. So the county is fortunate to have a debt team that is fiscally prudent and experienced in debt management and issuance that includes over 70 years of county experience in debt and pension obligation uh, bond uh, subject matter experts. In the course of our regular debt review, which we, we do annually, uh, the county's pension unfunded liabilities was determined to achieve substantial savings from a refinance uh, if we considered using a pension obligation bond. Bond rates, as you know, are historically low right now, um, and a recent uh, pension obligation bond was issued uh, at 2.7% at for another agency, which is substantially lower than our CalPERS uh, current interest rate on our pension at 7%. Uh, and this is projected to conservatively provide significant savings if we were to consider a pension obligation bond. So I'd like to turn it over to Marcus at this time and Suzanne so they can provide further information. Thank you, Christina, and good morning, board. I'm honored to follow Christina's um, lead in and thank you for that. Um, like any project that we would do, we began with the end in mind on this one. We know that there's a lot of public concern um, and just cautionary advice around pension obligation bonds. So we've, as Christine outlined, we've taken this step very cautiously, very thoroughly, and relied on our industry experts, our many, many um, years of experience, and our own county staff and subject matter experts. And we arrived at this recommendation today that basis that starts with the end in mind, what are our goals? What do we want to achieve? And primarily what we hope to achieve is stabilizing our future payments and cash flows. In addition, we want to diversify some of our risks, and we've done that by how we structured this bond proposal. And we want to increase our, our funded level of our pension plans, which overall will stabilize the entire system, especially the county's plans for our safety plan. And when we look forward to the years ahead, um, we're looking at the approximately $69.9 million of savings over the life of this bond issue. We're looking to how some of those future savings might be able to help us pay down our pension obligation bonds faster in the future. Um, we know these, these rates are going to be in the high six, if not 7% as they are right now. And just a fiduciary responsibility, you look at that highest debt and, and you want to bring that down faster. So our goal is, those are many of our objectives and goals. The chart that you see there, um, that blue line illustrates 
the kind of the, the growth in the escalation of our pension obligation bonds. And this is something that all agencies are experiencing. This is not unique to the county. You can overlay this chart on any agency's plan, and you'll see that same trend line. Over the next 10 years, those debt service costs continue to rise, rise, rise. And as we've outlined in the staff report, the actual cost of the pension benefit is, is relatively stable and flat. It's those debt service on the pension obligation bonds. So our, our proposal would flatten the curve, take that top of that mountain down, and give us a longer-term, stable, predictable cash flow. What we've structured in the bond issue is focusing on our two safety plans. Um, the primary reason is we have some active measures within our miscellaneous plan, including discussions with our superior courts about how we might create a, a sub-plan uh, or miscellaneous plan for superior courts. And as you know, we just heard in the other action item with our Santa Cruz Animal Shelter, um, we have an animal services JPA that's an independent body, but they're merged in with our miscellaneous plan at the county. We'd like to explore how we might separate those that miscellaneous plan into three parts. And while we're doing that, we didn't want to put any risks or issues in that with this refinancing proposal. So we're focusing on our safety plans. That still yields substantial savings when we look out to the future. Um, this action would increase the funded level of those plans from below 70% up to 90%, stabilizing those plans, and still remain with a little bit of an unfunded balance that gives us a hedge against future unknowns that are out of our control, such as CalPERS investment rate of returns. And a lot of this is summarized in the report. We hope you read that and, and really um, understand that. We want to next go into Suzanne Harold. I'm going to hand it off to her, talk a little bit more detail about the nuts and bolts of pension obligation bonds. Uh, Suzanne Harold has been advising the county for a number of years to provide independent subject matter expertise that supplements our own staff resources. And in the last couple of years, along with Joan Tall, uh, the two of them have supported five different pension obligation bonds uh, across California. So we're really grateful that not only do we have the subject matter expertise in-house who's helped us with debt financing, but Suzanne has also had a depth experience in pension obligation bonds. So I'll turn this over to Suzanne and she can talk a little bit about the pension obligation bonds and the risk, and the risk there. Suzanne, are you with us? Thanks, Marcus, and uh, good morning to the chair and members of the board. Um, we're going to start and talk a little bit about what pension obligation bonds are. They're primarily a debt management tool. Um, as you saw on the chart, where um, the intent is to replace the escalating CalPERS debt service payments for the unfunded liability with a stable and more predictable bonded uh, debt service payment. Um, the proceeds of these bonds can only be remitted to CalPERS um, to satisfy um, the obligation to fund the UAL. Um, and they differ from what the board typically sees um, in its lease revenue bonds in that uh, due to some special provisions that we undertake for pension obligation bonds, there's no required lease of an asset to secure the debt payments. Um, the bonds um, are expected to be issued at a fixed rate. Uh, the county has a triple A general obligation bond rating. We're hoping to have that affirmed. And uh, that will be um, that the, the rating drives kind of the interest rate on, on the POBs. Um, they'll be structured very similar to a lease revenue bond with a 10-year optional call. Um, and I think that's, uh, I think, Marcus, we can. Um, go to the next slide. Um, there are um, certain uh, risks associated with pension obligation bonds. You know, in a typical refinancing, you're swapping, say, a fixed rate bond for another fixed rate bond at a lower interest rate. And if that was the end of the story, that would be easy. Um, but because you're uh, uh, remitting the proceeds of the pension obligation bonds to CalPERS, and it goes into their investment pool. As you know, every year, CalPERS um, target rate of return is 7%. And if they um, achieve higher than that, uh, they give you kind of a credit against your unfunded liability. And if they achieve a lower rate of return than that, they, uh, they add to your unfunded liability. So in effect, we're swapping fixed rate debt for variable rate debt. 
Um, we do look at the existing debt as if CalPERS was going to earn 7% over the long term. And that's kind of the baseline assessment. Um, and that's where the savings come from. But again, eyes wide open, we need to determine, you know, what, what does it look like? What is the impact at different uh, CalPERS long-term investment rates of return? So Marcus, I think we can go forward. So there's um, the National General uh, Governmental Financial Officers Association or the GFOA has indicated they have five areas of concern uh, regarding pension obligation bonds. Some of them are really related to the structure of the pension obligation bond um, and some kind of statistical uh, rating credit implications of pension obligation bonds. So out of the five um, concerns of the GFOA, four of them are really addressed through how we structure the bonds. And um, there's a lot of information in your board letter today uh, about those four. Um, the one that is really, um, that we're focused on is the top one here, where the pension obligation bond, when viewed as an investment with CalPERS, meaning you're investing in the pool, uh, might fail to earn more than the pension obligation bond interest rate. So again, CalPERS um, currently requires a 7% rate of return and is charging you 7% on your unfunded liability. We're estimating a 3% interest rate on the county's uh, pension obligation bonds. So there is quite a, um, there's quite a substantial differential between uh, what they're required to earn um, versus what your interest rate is. And so we're really, again, looking at this more as a debt management tool, um, uh, exchanging higher rate in interest rate debt for lower interest rate debt. But the CalPERS investment returns do need to be monitored closely. And again, think about the impact of what a lower interest rate does to your, to your overall savings. So Marcus, if you want to so this, uh, this graphic shows two things. So the yellow bars would be the uh, pension obligation bonds and any remaining UAL from just the 90% funding. Um, so that is what your, um, your UAL debt profile would look like after the issuance of the bonds. The red line is what CalPERS would charge you at a 7% rate of return um, through the next uh, 25 years. So you can see that there's a differential between, as Marcus was mentioning, you know, there's the escalating debt service and we're kind of cutting that top off by um, issuing debt at a more level, stable, sustainable uh, amount. Now, if CalPERS were to only earn 6% going forward, starting today, um, that is, and, and you didn't issue any bonds, that is what the black line looks like. So that is what your UAL payments would be um, if you did nothing and CalPERS earned 6%. And then the blue bars are the added, um, the added UAL payments if, Cal, if you issued the pension obligation bonds and then CalPERS only earned a 6% rate of return. And you can see there's still substantial savings during the early years. And it's really only in the later years where you get a few, you get some debt service that's higher than what the UAL would have been if you had done nothing. Um, and so I think this is kind of bookends, like kind of what the um, what the expectation should be going in with your eyes open about pension obligation bonds. That yes, if CalPERS only earns six percent, it does use up some of your savings, but in the long term, it doesn't do much to increase your payments over what they would be if you did not issue the bonds. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, we're now to hit the home stretch. Um, this, what we wanted to recap with is what's coming next. Today's action continues our evaluation process. And this next slide illustrates the timeline that's coming next. This does not we are not asking to finalize your, our actions. We want to continue our processes. One of them is one of our concurrent processes will be going to our superior courts and starting what's called the validation process. Another process will be us continuing to build up our financing package, including our offering statement and conducting a rating call with standard employers. So we have multiple actions that we want to bring forward and come back to you on August 24th. That is ultimately what we're asking for your approval today 
the authorized concurrent processes that would come back on August 24th and finalize this presentation and our recommendation to you for the safety plans. Included in the staff report is this action to authorize the issuance of one or more series of pension obligation bonds to refinance the outstanding obligations of the county to the California Public Employees Retirement System with respect to the county safety plans and sheriff safety plans and authorize the concurrent judicial validation action approving and directing the related matters. Uh, that effectively does and concludes our presentation for today and we're happy to be available to answer any questions. And again, we want to really point you to the staff report. We put a lot of emphasis on there's a lot of more detail in the staff report, a lot of attachments, a lot of charts, a lot of modeling it's done. And we'll be coming back to you on August 24th to um, have a, 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 another chapter of this conversation asking for a final direction. So thank you, Christina. Thank you, Suzanne. And we're done. Yeah, I want to thank you and the whole team uh, and the CAO's office for, uh, for and the finance team for bringing this plan to the board. Uh, this is a smart way to manage our obligations. Uh, on our safety pensions over time and result in the significant savings as we've seen. Uh, the value of our county AAA bond rating is uh, noticed and uh, I want to, that's to be given credit to the county through the past, uh, past several years that we got there. That helps a lot. Uh, I also appreciate that the managing the debt in this manner will not negatively uh, impact our ability to bond for other needs uh, as they arise for the potential addressing existing needs uh, that other that have no other revenue source. So um, this is a great to smart and uh, forward looking. And I really appreciate the CAO's office and particularly the finance team that just presented this to us. Uh, is there anybody else on the board who would like to make a comment? Yes, uh, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Mowry, Ms. Pimentel, Ms. Harrell, as always. Um, and for the detailed report, the written report, I, I did have a question in regards, just to make sure that I fully understand actually what's being uh, presented here. It, did I read correctly that there is a refinance capability at 10 years so that, I mean, should, if, for example, it's well below a 7% return in the next five, six, seven, eight, nine years, there is a fail safe in essence, because it appeared as though those savings uh, the risk was actually 10 years out, for lack of better terms, by looking at the charts, but that also seems to be tied to when we would have a fail-safe opportunity for refinance. Am I reading that correctly? You, you are, Supervisor Friend. That is exa exactly right. We'll have the opportunity to reconsider these this issuance in 10 years. Okay. And would there then be connected to this some sort of annual, biannual? I mean, what, what kind of looks would, would future boards have to, to know where they are and where they stand in situations like this? I think we... As a normal course of our next actions, when we come back on August 24th, we'll be presenting you some policies. Included in that will be a policy on managing our unfunded obligations and our liabilities. And inherent in that will be regular reporting. We need to stay monitoring, closely monitoring what's happening in the market and what's going on with CalPERS, what are they changing in their long-term assumptions. Every three years, they're re-looking at their assumptions. So we'll be talking about this quite a bit over the next 20 years. Fair enough. Yes, their assumptions do change frequently and not generally for the better for local governments. Um, so in addition to that, um, it, I mean, the way that I view this, and I appreciate you bringing this forward, is that, I mean, e if we didn't do this, I feel like it would really uh, hinder future boards on, on the kind of options because of the amount of, of costs that this really would be, you know, the, the future boards are going to be faced with. And this does free up uh, at least provide some flexibility for other investments during the course of that time. And, um, the risk based on the 10-year horizon to me seems seems low. I think there's a much greater risk to inaction in this situation because we know uh, where that kind of hockey stick inflection would go on this on these pension obligations and and how that would um, what kind of risks that would that would face for our, our government here. So I appreciate your work on this. I mean, I'm I'm comfortable with with the um, the work that you've done to mitigate it and the options for the board moving forward on it. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any other comments from the board? Uh, Supervisor Caput. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks, uh, Christina and Mark, uh, uh, for the report. <clears throat> if we go back to the 1990s, this is where uh, somebody, uh, you know, people were trying to deal with, uh, do we give a raise or do we do more for their pension? And uh, at the time, it seemed like... Uh, a good fix, like a Band-Aid at the time, but now we're dealing with the problem here in 2020 and 2021. Uh, 
what is, is I was looking at the long range uh, savings and projections. Uh, that's what I'm looking for is, is he going to make it a lot better in the future rather than just temporarily, you know, uh, trying to fix something right now and later on it'll be worse. But uh, the projections is that over the long haul that we're going to save quite a bit of money. Okay. Uh, my question would be, what would be the worst case scenario? Uh, how could somehow this turn out to be um, something that we don't expect? That's a great question, Supervisor Caput. I think for us, we, we try to demonstrate some of that. Um, CalPERS, there's a couple things that are happening right now that are going to complicate your, your question or the answer to your question. One is we're grateful to CalPERS. They're rethinking how they create their investment pools and mitigate future risks. So one option they're looking at is allowing agencies like us who, who do things that increase our funded status to go into a more conservative pool. So that would mitigate our any of those you know, worst case scenarios that by moving our investments into a more conservative, more stable investment vehicle. I think the ultimate risk is CalPERS earns you know, 0% or negative 5% over a long run. That's just not likely. They've tended to average 6% up to 8.5% over 5, 10-year periods of time, over 20-year periods of time. So I think we've done a good job of that scenario that, that, that Suzanne presented to you, that what if CalPERS earned 6% over a long period of time? That probably is a, a, a big uh, likely negative outcome. And, and what you saw there is it really was uh, 15, 20 years down the line when we had a few years that we might be paying more in debt for service, but we still have more savings overall for the plan. So I think we've demonstrated that the worst case scenario at that 6% range still yields savings to us. And there's a few years down the line, way down the line that we might pay a little bit more, but that's you know on, on the far end. Okay, uh, the, the only other question would be, uh, we're actually not locked in at a certain rate. It, it's kind of, it is it is a variable. The the rate, what we're proposing now is to go into a fixed interest rate. Um, we'll, we'll lock that rate in after August 24th. When we come back to the board on August 24th with final direction for tuition, that's after that point in time, we'll be locking that rate in over, over the period of time. So we'll, we'll okay. end up with a fixed interest rate. We will. Okay, it'll be fixed. Yeah, it's kind. Of, it's kind of like a, a refinance of a mortgage on our house, right? Uh, I remember calling uh, when I did refinance. Uh, they said we'll lock you in at this rate. If it goes up or down, you're, you'll be locked in at this rate. Uh, and then we did the paperwork. So that are we locked in yet, or we have to wait? No, that that'll come after after that'll we come, we'll come back to the board on August twenty fourth. We'll be looking at rates at that time. Okay. Hey, thanks a lot. Take care. Supervisor Koenig, do you have a comment? Yeah, yeah thank you, Chair. Um, it, it does appear that we're looking at some very serious costs if we do nothing that will, will really hinder uh, our ability to make essential investments in the future. So, I mean, as Supervisor Friend said, the, the risk of inaction seems higher than, than taking this action today. I mean, I, I think we do have an opportunity here with historic low interest rates. And um, as Supervisor Caput said, this is very much like refinancing a house. Uh, we're seeing huge amounts of refinancing uh, today to take advantage of these low interest rates. And um, I think it makes perfect sense that the, the county would essentially do the same thing with our unfunded liabilities. You know, I also appreciate that uh, we're hedging our bets here, um, you know, by leaving out the miscellaneous group, by only funding 90% um, of the, the safety pool. Um, so, you know, we're not going all in on this um, and, and we are um, providing some, some room um, to deal with the uncertainty going forward. And, um, you know, I think if, if we do see the upside, we are looking at some very significant savings. I mean, over $2 million a year, that's, that's a huge amount. That's, that's close to all the money we have uh, for local road resurfacing in the county. Um, and so we can definitely um, potentially use that money to make some much needed investments in the community. So thank you, uh, Ms. Mowry and Mr. Pimentel for your work um, and definitely support these actions. Supervisor Kuhner. Yeah, I just want to echo what others have said. I think we're at a historically low interest rate period. Makes sense to lock in interest, lock lock our our 
obligations in at this interest rate. And I really appreciate the deliberate um, approach to this of really thinking it through, understanding the risks, uh, looking at options, and then pursuing this option uh, going forward. So I look forward to seeing what comes back in August, but I appreciate the efforts uh, that are being made to help the taxpayers of Santa Cruz County. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do we have any public comments? Yes, I have one speaker to this item. Caller 2915, your microphone is available. Good morning, this is Becky Steinbrunner. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. I, um, I applaud the county's efforts to reduce the debt uh, for the, the CalPERS pension, unfunded pension. I kept reading about all of the savings and as I said earlier, I could not see any of the screens that the presenters um, made a apparent to you, but in looking at the material available, luckily I do have internet service this morning, I was able to read them, I never saw the total cost of the pension obligation bonds until the very end in Exhibit A with the resolution. I'd like clarification. I see two numbers in Exhibit A, 121.5 million, and then at the end, it says the calculated uh, end uh, bond amount would be 167250000 factoring in a quarter of a million dollars annually in cost to administer these bonds. Would that quarter of a million go to the, um, the bond company or does... Who gets that money? Who is the administrator of the bond? I also have a question about the Superior Court validation process. Uh, would that be done in the Superior Court of Santa Cruz County? I request as a member of the public that we be apprised of that date of judicial validation. And finally, I have a concern about foreign investors buying these bonds and um, economic and equity in the um, the bond market, who's going to be buying these and what are... Yeah, I think that's the point. Thank you, Chair. That is the end of speakers for this item. Okay, I think we got the end of that comment uh, also. Um, entertain a motion. Sure, Mr. Chair, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I wanted to ask one question, which was, I didn't. I know that some of the other jurisdictions around us are also looking at um, this approach, and I don't know if we uh, combined with them if we could lower some of our transaction costs, um, and or if it just complicates things. So I wanted to ask that that question. It's a great question, Supervisor Community. I think it would complicate things. The, the requirement to, to go down to judicial validation is a, is a uniqueness to the pension obligation bonds that would really be a barrier to doing a joint effort, but, but it's something that we're having active conversations with our community partners around about what our intentions are, what our expectations are. And we're trying to share our best information and knowledge and, and cross-share that with each other. So we're doing our best to work collaboratively, but I think you know, falling short of doing a, a, a county-wide, all-city, one issue it's just not. It's just not something that's really set up that way. But it's a great aspiration. Okay, that makes sense. I can move the recommended action if if folks are ready. Okay. Second. Community and friend, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Yes. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank, thank you, and congratulations again to everybody who worked so hard on this. It's going to be a real benefit to Santa Cruz County. Uh, we will move to item number 10 as the Board of Directors of the Davenport County Sanitation District. Uh, this is a public hearing to consider ordinance amending Title III of District Code establishing 2021-22 water service charges and ordinance amending Title IV of the District Code establishing the 2021-22 service 
service sewer service charges for the Davenport County Sanitation District. Direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance on the May 18th, 2021 agenda for final adoption and set Tuesday, June 29th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for public hearing on the service charge reports and take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the district engineer. We have several items. We have ordinance uh, 97, it's a sewer clean copy. Uh, and then there's a strikeout underline. Ordinance 98, a uh, clean copy. Uh, and this is referring to water uh, and a strikeout underline. Uh, item number E, Davenport charge reports, notice of public hearing. And F, uh, Davenport County water and sewer charge reports. Uh, it's on the web link. Uh, I think uh, Ashley uh, Trujillo is going to present this. I got that right, I hope. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Chairperson, Directors of the Board. I'm Ashley Trujillo. I'm the Sanitation Engineer for the Davenport County Sanitation District. On March 9th, the Board set today as the date for the public hearing to consider the proposed 2021-2022 sewer and water service charges. The overall proposed increases for the water and sewer charges are 3.2% and 4.6% respectively. These increases are necessary to cover the treatment, operation, maintenance, and capital requirements of the water and sewer systems. It is therefore recommended that the board um, do the recommended actions to hold a public hearing upon its conclusion consider approval and concept of ordinances amending district code title three chapter 3.08 article three section 3.08160 through 3.08180 for water service charges and district code title four chapter 4.08 article three section 4.08160 through 4.08.180 for the sewer service charges for the Davenport County Sanita Sanitation District. Direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinances on the May 18th, 2021 agenda for final adoption. Set Tuesday, June 29th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for a public hearing on the service charge reports. And direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of the public hearing once a week for two weeks before the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any comments from the board? Uh, seeing none, is there any com uh, public comment? There are no speakers from the public for this item. Okay, we will return the item to the board. Uh, uh, yeah, I'll thank Mr. Trujillo and I'll move the recommended actions. I'll second. Trinity Caput, uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson? Aye. Thank you. You have, well, sorry, motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we may move to the final item of the day before we go into closed session. Uh, as Board of Directors of the Freedom County Sanitation District, a public hearing to consider ordinance amending Title III of District Code established in the 2021 22 service. Uh, charges to the Freedom County Sanitation District direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance on the May 18th, 2021 agenda for final adoption, set Tuesday, June 29th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or thereafter as the date and time for the public hearing on the service charge reports and related take related actions as outlined in the memorandum of the des district engineer. Uh, item A is ordinance F28, a clean copy. Uh, item B is a, a strikeout underlined copy. No, item C is a notice of public hearing for 21-22, and item D, the Freedom County Sewer Charge Report on the web link. Uh, again, Ashley Trujillo. Thank you. So again, this is Ashley Trujillo, sanitation engineer for the Freedom County Sanitation District. And on March 9th, the board set today as the date for the public hearing on the proposed 2021-22 sewer charges for the district. The proposed overall charge increase of 8.3% is necessary to adequately fund the district's treatment, maintenance, operations, and capital costs for the sewer system. 
It is therefore recommended that the board hold a public hearing and upon its conclusion, consider approval and concept of the ordinance amending district code title three, chapter 3.08, article three, section 3.08, establishing the 2021-22 sewer service charges for the Freedom County Sanitation District. Direct the clerk of the board to place the ordinance on the May 18th, 2021 agenda for final adoption. Set Tuesday, June 29th, 2021 at 9 a.m. or thereafter is the date and time for a public hearing on the sewer charge service reports and direct the clerk of the board to publish the notice of public hearing once a week for two weeks before the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, comments from the board? Yeah, I, just one the question. Test. Yeah, thank you. Uh, is, is this uh, the rate? Uh, increase uh, we're asking is, is this for the work that's being done in uh, district four and also supervisor friends work uh, district that's going on right now airport boulevard uh, and green valley road watsonville so a portion of the increase is to fund um, the debt payments for the usda loan that we got it was a partial loan and grant to do the work that's going on now um, another portion of the increase is to fund the city's project that we were joint partners with that was in Airport Boulevard. And then um, the largest, well, not the largest, the second largest con contributor to the increase is the increase in the city treatment costs due to the improvements that they're required to do at their plant. So we pay a portion of that as well. Right. I, I remember about five years ago, uh, we were dealing with a, a possible rate increase that could have been a lot higher. And uh, I want to thank you uh, for keeping the rates as low as they are right now. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ash. Any other comments from board members? Or comments from the public? There are no speakers to this item. Okay, we will return the item to the board for action. I have a motion. I'll move the recommended actions. Second. Moved by uh, Friend, the second by Koenig. Uh, please call the roll. Supervisor Koenig. Aye. Friend. Aye. Coonerty. Aye. Caput. Aye. McPherson. Aye. Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you, Mr. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, we will now, uh, that completes our regular agenda. Uh, we will now move into closed session. We have two items. Are there any items that are reportable, Mr. Heath? There's nothing reportable today, thank you. Okay, uh, we will take, it is now uh, 10.30. Uh, good job today. Uh, we will take 10 minutes and uh, get into closed session in 10 minutes, okay?